Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Macroverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about the most recent jobs report. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So we had a pretty blowout jobs report today. The unemployment rate, well, stayed relatively flat. I mean, it's still at 3.7%. Um, if you were to go take a look closely, you can see that we popped up here to 3.8% for you know three months, and then we dropped down to 37 and now we've been at 3.7% for three months. So the, the labor market in that regard still remains relatively strong. It has not shown the, um, you know, a, a move yet above 4%. If you were to take a moving average, uh, like a three month moving average, you can see that it was going up the three month SMA, but yet it has pulled back recently to where the three month SMA is back down to, to 3.7%. So pretty good numbers coming from the unemployment rate. If you were to look at and there's some other we, we can we could also break it down by category uh, we could look at like 16 to 19 year olds and see that it's fallen a little bit here it, it had reached a level of 12.4 percent by october and it's actually fallen a little bit here going into the latter part of last year and the early part of this year if we were to take a look at what it was doing a year ago you can see let me sort of zoom in over here you can see that for 16 to 19 year olds a year ago it was it actually found sort of a local high in um, November of 2022 uh, here it found a local high in October of 2023 and of course last year it it essentially and we just got the data point for January so we're essentially looking at at sort of comparing this data point to this one right here right <laughs> from January 2023 and you can see that um, sort of from like a cyclical point of view this this metric trended down until may and then starting in may and then moving you know through october that's when that's when it started to go up so that's an interesting metric i also want to take a look at the unemployment level uh this is something that we got today um we saw 144,000 144, to the downside meaning the unemployment level fell and that's of course reflected in in the unemployment rate right i mean you can see that it, it was at 6.26 6.27 million and then it dropped all the way down to about 6.12 million if we were to take a three-month moving average of that i mean you can see it, it it essentially just looks like the like the unemployment rate we could also go take a look at the unemployment level by reason for unemployment um, you have job losers which dropped about thirty thousand. Uh, still technically in an uptrend, but it has leveled off here recently. You could look at job, lo job losers on temporary layoff, also dropped by about 41,000. We could also go look at, at new entrants to the labor force. This is one of the ones that has been moving up probably the most aggressively for a little while. That one dropped off pretty big uh, this last month, right? And if you take a three-month estimate of that one, you know, and you try to get tune out some of the noise, you can see that it has been moving up um, from, you know, the mid 400K range all the way up to the, you know, near around 600K range. So pretty big move in a short period of time, but this month it had a fairly substantial drop. We can also go take a look at the unemployment rate per state. I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time here. This was actually updated um, about a week ago. But just to go through a few states, some of them look better than others. Um, and, and again, a lot of them still have relatively low unemployment rates, right? Like the unemployment rate in, in Alabama is 2.6%. Is but if we were to go look at some of the other, you know, some of the larger states by population, right? If you were to look at, at California, the unemployment rate continues to, to not do so well. It's all the way up at 5.1%. One of the reasons I think is because as we've gotten further and further into the tightening cycle, a lot of the tech companies, the smaller market cap tech companies, you know, they just haven't done as well, right? It's, it's certainly easy to look at, at companies like Apple and, and Meta and, and Alphabet and so on and so forth, Microsoft, and see that they're doing well, but they also have a lot of cash on hand, they have healthy balance sheets, and they're more likely to survive 
tightening cycles. Whereas a lot of the smaller market cap stuff that maybe doesn't have as good, healthy of a balance sheet, those stock, those places are, are, are struggling more and of course are laying people off. And, and that, that might be one of the reasons why you see places like California uh, with an unemployment rate that continues to go up. While other places, for instance, like Connecticut, while it has gone up recently, I mean, it, it, there's no denying that the unemployment rate in, in Connecticut has started to turn up, right? I mean, it was 3.5, now it's been 3.6, and then it moved to 3.8. It's still nowhere near California, which is at 5.1. And there's some other places, I believe, up in, you know, up in New England. Um, I believe like Rhode Island is one that has relatively low unemployment rate. Again, one of these where it's, it's moved up recently, but in September, it was all the way down at 2.6%, right? I mean, you know, if you think back to the, the national rate was, was 3.4, but in Rhode Island, it was all the way down here at 2.6. Now it has started to move up recently, right? 2.6, 2.7, 2.9, 3.2. I mean, it's certainly moving up, but it, it was moving up from a relatively low level. We could go take a look at New York. Um, unemployment rate in New York is now at 4.5%. So uh, back in August, it was at 3.9 and then 4 and then 4.2 and then 4.3. And now it's coming in at 4.5. And if we were to go take a look at, at Texas, that might be another interesting one to look at and, and perhaps Florida. Texas is a state where you can actually see that the unemployment rate fell somewhat recently. And I mean, again, if, 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 <laughs> Right, if the unemployment rate is still at 3.7%, there have to be some states, right, where the unemployment rate is actually going down. I mean, so far we've looked at ones where it was going up, but there have to be some where it's going down if the unemployment rate is, is staying stagnant at 3.7%. But you can see that the unemployment rate in Texas, uh, the lowest it went this cycle was around 3.7. It then moved up to in the 4.1% range for a long time, and then it just had to drop down to 4%. And the last one, I, I think, um, unless I think of anything else I wanted to look at was uh, was Florida. Florida, and maybe the District of Columbia. Florida, the unemployment rate, still relatively low. I mean, again, like we can always say, yeah, it is trending higher, right? I mean, of course, it, it is trending higher. It was also trending higher over here, right? But the angle of attack at this point wasn't that steep, and then the angle of attack steepened a lot, and that's where the economy, you know, that's where the economy actually slowed down. Um, even over here, right, in, in, in the unemployment rate in Florida, in, you know, this cycle bottomed out in the low twos and it was slowly trending up, but it took until this hit about 4% before the economy really slowed down and, and it's currently at, at 3%, right? And it was at, you know, it was at 2.8% a, a couple of months ago. Um, and then I did mention well, we can take a look at the district District of Columbia. This was one of the other ones, kind of like California, where it is it is higher, right? It's at five point one percent, and it was looking it was a little optimistic after it had hit these highs back over here at five point one because it had come back down to five percent, but then it's right back up to five point one, so starting to go back up. Um, hopefully, I can find some other ones where it's going down, just sort of show that in some in some states it has moved down. Colorado, it it actually increased. Um, Massachusetts, it is has increased as well. Um, pretty big jump actually from 2.9 to 3.2. But you get the idea. I mean, again, like the unemployment rate in a lot of these states, it's going up, but still at this point at a relatively low level. Okay, but trending in the wrong direction, but still at a relatively low level. And you could even look at at like the number of states where the unemployment rate is rising. Um, over the last month and see that over the last month, there's 27 states where the unemployment rate has gone up, right? So there's clearly some that have stayed flat um, or have, have decreased. This is only looking at ones that went up. So, right, if it stayed flat, then it's not included. If you, if you tune out a little bit of the noise and instead of looking at just one month ago, you say, all right, well, let's look three months ago, you can see that it, it is at about 43 states have an unemployment rate higher um, today than they did three months ago. But it's potentially, you know, I mean, you can see that it, over here, it came up to, you know, 242 back in October of 2022. Um, but then it fell, right? But then it fell as we got further into the year. And then here it's found this at least local high 
in November of 2023. Last year, it basically fell until January, right? January 2023, right? It, it topped out in October, it then fell in November, a big drop in December, and then it bottomed out in January. Here, it's October, November, and then December, right? So this last year from October to November was a pretty big drop. November to December was a pretty big drop. Here, October to November, it still went up. November to December, it did go down, but only, only slightly. Um, so it could be interesting to see how the trend changes or what it does next month, right? Like, does it does it continue to go down? Is it lagging this one, or is this just a very muted version of it, and it's something more than just, say, cyclical? Um, you could also look at it compared to six months ago, which really tunes out a lot of the noise. And if you look at it compared to six months ago, you can see that it's currently at 39 states, have a higher unemployment rate today than six months ago. Um, in October of 2022, it reached 41, right? So it reached 41 in October. And then it fell, basically it, it fell through um, through April, and then it started to go up starting in April. Uh, so we'll see if it you know if it follows a similar pattern or if it deviates. We can also take a look at alternative unemployment rate measures, right? Everyone knows this one here, the standard unemployment rate, which is U3. There's also U1, which means greater than 15 weeks unemployed. This is one that had been moving up more aggressively than than the other employment rates in terms of rate of change, but after moving up to 1.4, it's basically just hung around 1.4, 1.3, and actually went down slightly in this most recent report. We could also take a look at people not in the labor force. Um, not super exciting of a metric to, to look at. It hasn't really done a whole lot, but if you were to look at a year over year percentage change, it will take maybe a three month moving average. Um, you can see that it's, it's slightly positive. Continuing on, uh, we have the labor force participation rate. Um, that one stayed flat this last month, looking at a year over year uh, percentage change shows a pretty large drop basically from October. Um, and now it's looking at it, it's, it's about 0.1%. Uh, looking at the civilian labor force level, it looks like it dropped by about 175,000. Um, this is the civilian labor force level is the number of people who are either employed or unemployed, but actively seeking employment. Um, so that actually dropped by 175K, taking a year over year percentage change, right? You can see that it, it was at 2.24% and then now it's down all the way to 0.847%. So pretty large drop there in a, in a short period of time. We also have the employment level. So this is total non-farm. This is the, the, the blowout jobs report that we actually had today. Um, if you were to zoom in here, still trending higher, right? Still very much trending higher. But if you look at the month over month change, I'm trying to remove the, the, the pandemic stuff. If you look at the month over month change. Also last month, I believe, was revised higher as well. And so you can see that it's it's actually starting to go back up, right? Like it isn't, I mean, it hasn't, the monthly change hasn't put in a new low since December of 2022. As, as you know, as maybe as hard to believe as that is, that's what this looks like. Now, if you were to go look at the household survey, it looks a lot more grim, uh, where, where, you know, where they've lost jobs <laughs> by about the same amount that on the establishment survey that they've gained jobs, but this is just what the establishment survey says. Um, looking at it on a quarter over quarter basis, you can see that the quarter over quarter uh, percentage change has started to accelerate slightly here at 0.55%. And then finally looking at it on a year over year percentage change, you can see that it's now down to about 1.89%. That's total non-farm. We could uh, switch it up and look at some other sectors. Uh, there's like total private which also went up quite a bit. I mean, you might say, well, you know, is it just because of the government or, or something? But total private jobs, uh, the unemployment level went up by 317,000. Pretty large month over month gain, right? Pretty large month over month gain. In fact, in order to see a, a gain this much in a single month, you'd have to go all the way back to, in fact, exactly a year ago, right? I don't know if you guys remember, but we had a pretty large blowout number in January 
of 2023, right? You can see here, I mean, January 2023, we, we saw the month over month change at 0.27%. This January, it's at 0.236%, right? And taking a, a simple moving average, like a three month SMA, you can see that it's accelerated into that. Um, maybe one other category, and we'll look at, at manufacturing. Manufacturing went up by about 23,000. So um, pretty, I mean, not a huge change, but still a, a modest move up in manufacturing. Now let's go take a look at non-farm private payroll employment level. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is coming from the ADP, the Automatic Data Processing Research Institute. This is a lot noisier than the establishment survey that we just looked at, but you can see that they also added 107,000 jobs uh, when you're looking at, at total private. If you would, if you switch this over to say manufacturing, it they added only about 2,000 jobs. Sometimes looking at a year over year percentage change is interesting. I mean, you can see that it is shedding jobs, right? Manufacturing jobs um, have been have been dropping on a year over year percentage basis, um, but right, they're still they're still basically at the same level that they were pre pandemic. Right, so yes, they've they've dropped year over year, but still the same level as pre-pandemic. And there's other times in the past, right, where where they basically just trended sideways for a while. Um, there's leisure and hospitality is one that's always interesting to check in with. It is basically flatlined since July, right? It hasn't really made a huge move since July of last year. Um, looking at a year over year percentage change, it has it has you know come off its peak of 17%. And it's now down to just about about five percent or so. But I mean, if if this doesn't start to go up soon, then the year over year percentage change will of course continue to drop because I mean it's basically at the same level today in January as it was half a year ago, right? Now of course we are you know as we go into into the summer we might see that go up from sort of like a seasonality basis, but you get the idea um, as to why the year over year percentage change hasn't really you know, been going up as much because, well, it's basically been flat for the last six months. Um, total temporary help services employees. This has been one that has been in a, in a decline for quite a while. If you look closely, it topped out in March of 2022, and it's been mostly moving down ever since. Uh, but it actually did go up by about 3.9 thousand jobs um, in this most recent report, looking at a month over month percentage change. This is actually the first positive print that we've seen in this metric really since March of 2022. We had a couple, we had a few that came relatively close to putting in a positive print, but ultimately they were unable to do so. Okay, and this is one of those ones that looks a lot scarier when you look at it on a year over year percentage change basis. Um, you know, it's still at negative 7% and it's basically been at around negative 7%, um, you know, for, for about a year now. Job openings. Uh, continues to to slowly trend down over a macro scale, but in terms of locally, it, it has kind of leveled out here at this, you know, at around eight to nine million. So it hasn't made another drop just yet. And what a lot of this does is it really opens, the, it sort of raises the question, well, where is the neutral rate? You know, is the neutral rate lower than where we currently are? Is it higher? Obviously, Powell has said many times that we are clearly in restrictive territory. But the question is, is, you know, how restrictive is it? Or is it restrictive? You know, I mean, if they if they paused here at five and a half percent, and the economy starts to reaccelerate, and by association, inflation starts to reaccelerate, well, that could that could certainly present um, a problem. But if, if is this just a fluke? And I think this goes back to why Powell is very, you know, resistant to the idea of a March rate cut. How can you cut rates in March when you have, you know, unemployment rate still at secular lows? When you have, um, you know, blowout jobs report where you're gaining three hundred thousand jobs. And I know a lot of people are going to say the numbers are made up and manipulated, but I, you know, that stuff doesn't matter, right? This is what monetary policy is based on, and these are the numbers that we got, right? The the labor market is, it is, and it has been resilient. It doesn't mean that it won't eventually fold. That's what usually happens in tightening cycles, but the process, the business cycle process can, can take years. 
to to ultimately play out. So we will see. You know, I, I think it's fair for Powell to say like we're probably not going to cut in March because we're only going to get two more data points for each series for most series between now and the next Fed meeting. Um, and, and I mean, for and for this stuff, we're only going to get one more data point, right? We're only going to get one more unemployment rate print between now and the next March meeting because the March meeting's in in uh, you know late March, but we're only going to get one more unemployment rate reading between now and then. And I don't think there's going to be any. I mean, unless it comes in in February, well above four percent, I don't really think they're going to cut. Um, so I, I and I, I think it makes sense for them to just simply continue to hold there. Uh, job openings in terms of manufacturing job openings, it also it, it slightly went up, um, still above the the pre-pandemic levels. Some some categories look a lot more bleak, like retail trade is is actually below pre-pandemic levels, but it actually did get a, a bit of a nice bounce here coming into the beginning of the year. And, and we can actually go back to last year and, and see that, you know, December um, marked a local high in job openings in the retail trade, and then it trended down through basically March. So we'll see if it does the same thing here or if it's a new trend. And I think that's what Powell's looking at is, you know, is this just like some type of seasonal behavior where there's resilience in the labor market, just like there was last January, and then the next following few months, it, it then went back down? Or is the economy starting to reaccelerate and, and, and people are starting to get, um, you know, are more jobs being created? So I, I think, you know, honestly, I don't think they're going to cut in March. I think something pretty catastrophic would have to happen between now and March for them to want to cut. And and I, I think really the question becomes not whether they're going to cut in March, but whether they're going to cut in May. Um, and I mean, of course, it depends on how the labor market unfolds between now and then. But that's, I think, one thing we have to more so consider. If you look at it from the other perspective, right, if you look at it not from the sense of, of job openings or 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 people that are, you know, getting or that are that have a job. But if you look at job quits, you can see that people are still relatively scared to quit their job. Normally, as as we get further and further into tightening cycles, um, you know, people are, are less willing to quit because they're less likely to find another job. A lot of people might not quit until they found another job. Um, you know, if you think about it, most people don't go out and quit their job without having something else lined up. But there's maybe fewer people having stuff lined up because you can see that job quits continues to drop and is now below the pre-pandemic level, right? And I mean, you can see that, you know, in prior economic downturns, this metric was going down. But the counterpoint uh, to all of that is while it has gone down, it is still basically just back to where it was during, you know, pre-pandemic, right? So yes, this has basically just been getting, been getting a lot of the excess out. Um, now we're back to where we are pre-pandemic. And I, again, I think Powell's right. We have to get a few more data points here to make any conclusions. What if a lot of these metrics just sort of stabilize at the current pre-pandemic levels? If that's the case, then you don't really have any strong reason to cut. But if they, if they continue to drop um, relatively quickly, then, then of course you would have, have more reason to, to cut. And I mean, you could also look at look at it in terms of like retail trade. I mean, you can see that in terms of retail trade, job quits are at 423,000. The last time they were this low was back in 2015. So some sectors are certainly taking a bigger hit than others in terms of, you know, the flexibility of people to sort of quit their job and, and just go find a new job. And th there's also the job quits rate, which is basically the same thing. Um, initial claims still coming in relatively low. As I've said before, you know, if you're if you're thinking about like recession recessionary type initial claims, I think you'd have to see this in the 300,000 range um, for it to be recessionary, and so we're clearly not there at this time. And so I would not say that this constitutes as recessionary behavior uh, right now. Um, it has moved up here a little bit off the lows. Uh, do note that in January, you know, December January 2022, uh, or sorry, December 2021 January 2022, it, it had to move up. Um, same thing, January 2023, right? It had to move up. So um, I, I guess the question is, is, you know, is it is it doing something similar where it comes down here, puts in a low, and then just trends higher going into the middle part of the year, which certainly could be the case, right? That certainly could be the case. Um, it, but it even put in a lower low compared to where it was last January, right? Last January, initial claims bottomed out at 194,000. This January, they bottomed out at 189,000. With that said, 
they've already shot up to 224,000, which last year it took until the end of February for them to reach that level. And so the, the stuff on the, on the weekly is, is relatively noisy. I would always recommend putting in some type of, of moving average in there, whether it be a three-week SMA or a seven-week SMA to maybe get a better read on it. You can also look at initial claims per state, but it is really, really noisy, and this stuff is not seasonally adjusted. Uh, we could go look at continued claims. Continued claims continue to sort of show that while people haven't been getting laid off as much, um, there are still a significant number of people that are having a harder time finding a new job, right? So, you know, while people might be getting laid off at the same rate, there's still a lot of people that are hard, having a hard time finding a new job. And that's why continued claims continues to go up. And, and really, you can see that um, a year ago in, in January 2023, it was at 1.65 million. Now, remember, initial claims was the same, essentially, as it was in January 2023. But and um, but continued claims in January 2023 was at 1.63 million. Today, it's at 1.9 million. Okay, so you have another 300,000 people that are putting in continued claims compared to last year, right? So the 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 layoff rate as it's, it's essentially the same, maybe a little bit higher, but the number of people having a harder time finding a new job continues to to slowly go up. And I mean, you can see that here. January, it's starting to, to, to move up again. If you were to go look at last January, um, it, it, it essentially started, I mean, it was already moving up going into January, kind of like how it was over here, but it didn't find any type of local top until, until April. So that's um, continued claims. Uh, we also have continued claims per state, obviously not seasonally adjusted, so not that useful. But you can also look at the number of states where like the percentage year over year change of continued claims is going up. Um, if you want to buy a certain percentage here, we'll say, okay, 30%. You can see that the number of states where the year-over-year -year change was 30% or more reached a high at 27 states back in November. It has now since dropped all the way down to five, and now it's back up to eight uh, per the most recent reports. Number of states where the percentage year-over-year -year change in initial claims is greater than 30% um, uh, hit a high last year in July at 18, and it just hit a, a pretty low level of one. Uh, in December, and now it's all the way back up to 16. And this is what, of course, it looks like in the grand scheme of things. Certainly some areas in the past where it had some spikes up, but it didn't do anything. Uh, it looks like in order to be squarely in recession territory, you would need to see this metric go up to above maybe 25 or so. Like if half the country, if half the country has, you know, uh, if, if half the number of states has a year-over-year -year percentage change of initial claims that are greater than 30%, that has historically lined up with a recession, uh, but we're just simply not there yet. And there's no guarantee that we get there. I mean, you can see that, again, in July 2023, it went all the way up to 18. But then it just came right back down. Hires is another one that looks pretty weak, right? So, so some, of the, some of the metrics look strong. Some of them look weak. New hires still looks relatively weak, right? I mean, it, it did get a, a move up this past month, but still likely in a larger downtrend. Always possible it's going to bottom out. You know, I mean, it's going to bottom out somewhere. I don't know where that's going to be. And it's possible that it already has, but clearly the Fed, if you look at something like this, there's no way to know if, if it's bottomed out or not. And there's no way to know it because there's lags in monetary policy. We don't know the full extent of it until many years later. And it's only obvious, really, in, in hindsight. So again, I, I know a lot of that's confusing because there's so much, there's so much data, but what, there's, there's actually a cool thing we can do. We can actually look... At, at sort of, you know, we can normalize prior behavior and, and look to see, you know, is it recessionary or is it not? And we actually have it by categories here, interest rates, production and business, national income and product, unemployment. And in terms of employment, while some risks are slightly elevated, they're still relatively low. And even across the board, the main risk that is elevated is just yield curve risk, right? Interest rate risk. And the problem, of course, is that the longer they take to go to, to loose monetary policy, the more they risk this risk over here spilling over into these other categories. But again, it's really hard to know exactly when that's going to occur. And it's you know, impossible to, you know, to time that perfectly. Um, and there are cases in the past where the Fed has achieved a soft landing. And so I think that's always something you should keep in the back of your mind. 1967 was one, the mid-1990s was another. If you were to go take a look closer at, at some of the, the risk stuff, say the unemployment rate risk, it's at 0 0.005, right? Really, really low. It, it was starting to spike in October, but now it's come right back down. Um, 
the one with the highest risk is job openings because job openings has continued to fall. That risk has been all over the place, right? I mean, it's gone up, it's gone down, but until it really goes up and stays elevated, um, you know, it's hard to hard to know exactly when it's you know when it's going to hit. Um, and then maybe finally we could look at at continued claims risk. You know, it's popped up a little bit over over recent months, but even recently it's it's fallen back in a little bit. So interesting way to view the markets. Um, we could also go look at very quickly. We could go look at the SOM. Um, I believe it was the oh yeah it was the SOM rule recession indicator. So if you look at the SOM rule recession indicator, uh, it actually dropped back down. So what this means is when it crosses the gray line, that is a a recession signal. We haven't crossed it yet, so that signal has not yet been given. And again, I know people might be frustrated by by certain things, you know, by you know whether you whether you want it to just go back down and have a soft landing, or whether you want there to be a a um, a surge in this stuff, just so the Fed will finally pivot and, and maybe the smaller businesses will start to do well. It's important to remember that the business cycle takes years to play out, right? You should not be looking at this sort of stuff and saying, all right, this has got to happen on, on a really small time frame when we know it can simply take years for it to, it to play out. Um, so please keep that in mind. And, and if you, we actually have the SOM rule recession indicator per state. So we've coded it up to have it per state. And um, uh, you can see like in Alabama, it has not triggered. But I imagine, I imagine it, it has triggered in California. Yeah, it has triggered in California. I imagine it has triggered in the District of Columbia, right? It has. Um, in Florida, probably not, right? It hasn't. It's getting closer, but it has not yet triggered. Um, in Texas, it probably hasn't. We just saw the unemployment rate, I believe, go down. Yeah, so you can see that it, it actually went down. And New York, I don't think it has. Um, I could be wrong. Um, it, it's In New York, it is getting... I mean, it's getting relatively close, right? It's at 0.433, um, so 0.5 is is the threshold. So in some states, it's getting closer, um, a lot closer than than others. And then you can also look at simply the number of states where the SOM rule has triggered, and um, you can see that it has been recently going up, right? It it found a local top last year, um, or in in late 2022 of, of of 13. It then went all the way back down to two for a lot of 2023 and now it's starting to go back up right so it went from two to six to 11 and then now it's at 18. so that means now 18 states have triggered the SOM rule now the SOM rule was not designed at a state level in mind but if you did take some leeway and and apply it to that then you could see that 18 states have now triggered the SOM rule we could also go take a look at smooth recession probabilities still relatively low um only uh, as of December 2023, the odds that we were in a recession are only 0.74%. So relatively low odds that the, they will backdate a recession to, you know, to the end of 2023 at this point, given, you know, given the smooth U.S. recession probability indicator. We could also go take a look at the Kansas City Fed Labor Market Conditions Index. Continues to slowly drop, but still well above the zero line. Um, it's currently coming in at, at 0.78%. There's also the Kansas City Fed Labor Market Conditions Index, um, which I think it's probably worthwhile to apply some type of a, of a moving average to this. And you can see that it's basically just sort of oscillating around zero. So not a whole lot of growth, uh, but it also, it clearly does not look like, you know, these drawdowns at this point. So we've covered a lot, um, you know, as a reminder in terms of how does this affect you as an investor, the one thing I will, I will continue to reiterate, and I, I've said many, many times, over, over the years is that, you know, the further you get into tightening cycles, um, the more, you know, the more those higher market cap stuff outperforms the lower market cap stuff. And the reason is because the balance sheet of companies like Apple and Meta and, 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 and Alphabet and Microsoft, right, and, and NVIDIA, the balance sheet of those companies are really healthy. And, and a lot of investors can look at that and say, all right, you know, these companies, they will survive whatever comes next, right? They will survive it because they're not going to go anywhere even if the Fed does push us into a slowdown, right? The problem is that the lower market cap stuff, they're not getting that lifeline, right? Like think about all the small businesses that just started their company a year ago. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have, you know, billions of dollars of cash on hand to fall back on. And so what happened today? 
right? You have the S&P up, you have the NASDAQ up because the mega cap tech stuff are doing really, really well, right? Meta is up 20% today alone. By the way, you know, Meta was a, was a company back in late 2022, I, I was very vocal on ITC Premium that regardless of, ever, of if a recession ever does come, I said that $100, less than $100 is extremely deep value on, on something like Meta. And now what's crazy is a mega cap tech stock is up essentially 5x since then. You know, we talk about, you know, Bitcoin and I also bought some Bitcoin back then, but Bitcoin is, is only up about 3x. I mean, you're talking about a mega cap tech company up 5x in, in just over a year. And, and I, again, the, you know, the, the receipts are there on ITC Premium where we talked about how even if there is an eventual slowdown, Meta will likely not take out this low. And what will more likely happen is we'll just put in a, a much higher low, okay? Um, so the issue, of course, for, you know, for, for, for lower market cap stuff is that the higher the, the money just keeps getting diverted into all these mega caps because p investors are more confident that the mega caps can actually survive, right? And you know, money wants to find a home, it wants to find yield somewhere, and so it gets diverted into the mega cap stuff. The problem is look at the Russell today, right? It's down half a percent, right? It's down. And why is that? Well, it's because a lot of the companies in the Russell, they don't have you know, tens of billions of dollars to fall back on. And all this means, all the labor market report means is that the Fed is now further away from cutting than they were a few weeks ago. Now the market is thinking there's only a 21 and a half percent chance there's going to be a rate cut in March. So the companies that are relying on looser monetary policy to increase demand, those companies now have to wait even longer to see that, right? They have to wait even longer to, to get to the point where they can say, all right, great. We have lower interest rates. Therefore, we're going to get more demand. Um, and, 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 and then their stock price goes up, right? That has been pushed out. So that the issue for the smaller market cap stuff is the further and further and further that rate cuts get pushed out, some of these companies just... They say enough is enough and they go bankrupt, right? And they lay people off. And so that's where we are in the business cycle is that these, a lot of these smaller companies, right? They are going, those are the ones going bankrupt, laying people off. And a lot of the money is getting diverted into the higher market cap stuff that people are more confident will survive long-term. That's at least my interpretation of it. And, and you can really understand it even better by looking at say like the valuation of the Russell against the NASDAQ. Right, the Russell continues to bleed to the NASDAQ as we are continuing to go into looser and looser monetary policy. Do you see this or in as we're going further into, into tightening, not looser monetary policy? Do you see these months here? Right. There's like, you know, about half a year here where the Russell outperformed the NASDAQ. That was after we got back into QE and loose monetary policy. But the further we go into tighter and tighter monetary policy. And by the way, you don't have to raise rates to go into tighter monetary policy. It could just be that you hold them there for a while, right? Think about how many companies would really like there to be lower interest rates. I mean, even on the, on the earnings call with Tesla, I believe they were talking about how, you know, some of their demand issues are just because of rates are so high. And if rates could come back down, that would bring demand back. But if you're the Fed, how do you lower rates with blowout job reports like we just saw? Because if you do, if you do lower rates, too soon, then you run the risk of inflation reaccelerating, just like it did in the 1970s, where by the way, it came down here to 3%, and then it started to reaccelerate. Okay, the Fed doesn't want that. We're at 3%, right? Headline inflation has been at 3% since June. It hasn't, it's been sticky. It hasn't made that move. Core inflation has, has um, you know, it, it, it's been moving down, but not as quickly as the Fed would like. And so the, again, the issue is that until we get back to looser monetary policy, those lower market cap stuff are not going to do as well as, as the higher market cap stuff. Now that doesn't mean they can't ever go up in value, right? If the higher market cap stuff goes up, it can lift the other stuff up, but it just means there's not as much money 
going into those other 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 places just simply because investors are spooked if they can even survive the tightening cycle and that's it goes back to these you know all these ideas that we presented about higher market cap stuff doing better and and lower risk stuff doing better than higher risk stuff and the higher risk stuff will likely start to do better on the other side of rate cuts but at this point I don't think the argument is whether we get a rate cut in March. I think the argument is, do we get even get a rate cut in May? The Fed has said many times they're probably only going to cut. And I think in their dot plot in the SCP, the summary of economic the summary of economic projections, they've said uh, they're likely only only going to cut three times this year. And the market is still pricing in, you know, five rate cuts. They were pricing in six. Now they're pricing in five. But there, there's a good chance that the market is still, you know, still has too high of, of expectations. And if you go back to the last um, um, cutting cycle, you can see in 2019, in 2019, they only cut three times, right? They cut in July, September, and October. July, September, and October. So, you know, maybe the Fed cuts in May, but if they do, then they, maybe they cut in July. So maybe they do May, July, and November. Or maybe they delay it until June and they do June, September, and December. That could be something that plays out. So I think it, you know, I, I think it makes sense to be open-minded about, about that and, um, and to remember that you know, as it relates to, you know, to sort of cryptocurrency and whatnot, it wasn't until the Fed started to cut rates that Bitcoin showed a lot of weakness, right? Because remember last cycle, um, just sort of remembering what happened, it was around the time of, um, if we just pull it up, it was around the time of rate cuts that Bitcoin, that Bitcoin finally showed weakness. At this point, we're still pushing out rate cuts, right? So I don't, you know, we don't know how long it's going to take in order to, in order to even get to rate cuts, but it's probably not going to be March and it might be May, but we will have to wait and see. Anyways, if you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and again, check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at IntoTheCryptoverse.com. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.